Hi, this is Tim. Welcome to our PLC Programming Methods to Sequence Machine series. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the SQI Sequencer Input Instruction and the SQO Sequencer Output Instruction. Unlike our previous videos where we have walked through how to do a programming method, in this one, we're going to discuss the long-term issues with the SQI and SQO instructions and why other methods would be better. This is a condensed version of a live stream we did mainly hitting the highlights, and I'll put a link to the full live stream down in the description. Here is the program we're going to be going through today, and I'm going to be a lot more critical of myself than I was in the first program. The first program, if you recall, I had three hours of programming experience before I started this uh, 300 rung program, and this program has a lot of good things going for it but I think it misses some of those fundamentals in hindsight that make for an easy to troubleshoot program down the road. When I opened up the main routine, though, I cringed right away, and not off of this, mainly right down here, off of this sequencer logic right here. And this is something that a lot of you have asked me to go over how it works, and really I have I have not gone over it because I don't think this is a good way to sequence machines. If we just look at this rung, especially 20 years later, or never seeing the setup before, we're not going to have any earthly idea what this is doing. These two, the, this SQI sequencer input and this SQO sequencer output, are locked together by this control right here. You see the control of this one is lsbw1.control. Now lsbw1 was the name of this machine. So it, that control right there is the exact same as this. So as one of them goes up, the other one will go up. And that's what's going to tie these together. And just a really quick spill on the SQI because, like I said, I don't want to get too far into this is you've got an array here and this array is going to tell what conditions each thing needs to be in for each step of this so if we monitor this and i drag that out a little bit then we're going to see all these different ones and zeros which are things that it's looking for for all these steps and what's cool about this and why people like it from a programming standpoint is that if I want, and, and here's, here, we're getting, I'm getting ready to hammer, hammer myself pretty hard. If I wanted whatever bit four is here, would, that it, if I said it needed to be on right here, I can just type a one and that'll be a condition for it. It's that easy. And same with the outputs. If we go to them, and we go to monitor, then yeah, we see ones and zeros in various steps here. And these are the outputs that are going to be on during each step. And if I decide whatever the world number four is, I want it to be on in step four, I just need to put a one there. And now it's going to be on. That easy to make a change to our sequence. But here's where the problem comes in, is what in the world is bit four that I'm editing here. And I can put money that, yeah, yeah, there is zero description there. And probably um, up here, well, yeah, there's probably zero description. There's the inputs. There's zero description here. So there's no identifiable marks to help me understand what I was thinking on this sequence. You've got to really be in the mindset of wanting to, you know, of knowing what the world's going on. So I did this for quite a while, and finally I went to a plant and, you know, I was programming a machine, and the machine was working perfectly, and the maintenance supervisor came up to me, and, you know, he's like, hey, how's it going? You know, and I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, it's going good, and, you know, he's, he's feeling me out. I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, he's looking, he's like, hey, what is that? And he's pointing at that sequencer instruction, and I'm all proud, and I'm telling him exactly how it works, and this and that and the other, and, you know, he just nods, and, you know, he acts like he's learning, and at the end, he told me, he said, 
if you ever use anything like that again in this plant, then we're not going to allow you back in. And I was floored by it. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with it? He said, that particular instruction is very specific, one, to AB. And also, from a maintenance standpoint, looking at it later, if you don't know exactly what's going on, it's really difficult to follow. And and he was right in the end. He was wrong a little bit in the end because, hey, what I was doing is working. Even this machine here is still working. But from a maintenance standpoint, if you don't understand all the little things, it's very difficult. Now, the key to understanding this sequencer is this XOR statement here. But really, from a troubleshooting standpoint, if you're trying to figure out why something isn't working and you're looking across here, and you get to this XOR, and then you see this AFI, which is an always false input, you're gonna be like, oh, well, that must be something that else they were doing at some point, it's not important. And you would blow right past it and be like, next wrong. But what this is doing is this is comparing what the actual inputs are to what's in that particular array position for that sequencer step. And if there anything that doesn't line up is going to be right here. And that's why this is called diagnostics is so whatever this and let's see how I did at this, whatever bit number six is, is what the machine was waiting for at this particular time. So if I monitor this, I hope that I have some descriptions here. <sighs> and I don't, you know, so I was, I was very much dependent on a very sharp mind and a very fresh understanding of how the sequencer input and output setup worked. Because right now I don't know what bit six is. So to figure that out, I would have to get back up and look at these inputs here and hopefully they have descriptions. Please, do, oops, wrong place. Please tell me that they have descriptions. Um, monitor. Okay, well, yes, they have descriptions. And okay, number six was it had to be in the unload position. But all right, let's back up a little bit more and make sure, like I said, I don't want to get too much into how these sequencers work, but we're going to need to understand a little bit. So again, this array here is going to look at the sequencer position. So we have an array and we have the source and it's really gonna compare the two. In fact, you know, if I had to do it this way, and honestly, I would not do it this way today. Absolutely would not. Then one, I'm not worried about this mask because this mask is minus one. Now we've had some videos on this, but let's make sure we know what is minus one mean in a mask. Well, first, what is a mask? Is a mask, it says, which bits in this do you care about and which ones do you want to ignore? And the ones with a zero, we're going to ignore. The ones with a one, we're going to pay attention to. So if I just go and create a tag, let's close some of this out. Actually, got to edit tags anyway. And I'm just gonna call this my dent, and it's gonna be a double integer. And now I'm gonna to go to monitor tags. Then if we go to the value, right now the value is zero. And all of my bits are zero in this. And we did a binary episode that talked about this. But if I put a minus one in here, then it's gonna make all of the bits inside of it a one. And so I'm not even using that mask. Here, let's talk about the pitfalls of this. In fact, let me just delete this back out. This is where we were. And let's understand where these inputs are coming from. If we go down here, here are our inputs. And so these are the conditions individually that really how do I put this? It's not like this is what you need to get to the next step. These are conditions that it may or may not look at. So this is shear, punch, down. Okay, because yeah, we could be cutting or we could be shearing. And shear, punch, up. We got some clamps up, clamps down. 
angle and position, angle and drive. And mainly, though, when we go to look at this program, it's not real intuitive that what is wrong. Now, let's go back and look at this. So we had our diagnostics saying that it's bit six. That's what it's waiting on right now. And so then we've got to go, well, really, if I didn't know where I was going next, I would have to go to cross-reference, or I could go to monitor, and i got to find bit six. And now I'm going to cross-reference that. Okay, and yeah, output energized. Yeah, that's probably what it's waiting on. But even now, i got to think back in my head because I didn't even know it. Is it looking for it to be on, or is it looking for it to be off? And, well, let me, I mean, let's go back here. Okay. Right now it's a zero, and it is looking forward to be a one. So now I can go back and be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So it was looking at this point for it to be in the unload position. But really, quickly glancing at any of this from a troubleshooting perspective, this program is going to be really difficult. And in my opinion now, the sequencers are really difficult to troubleshoot. And this isn't just an A-B thing. This goes for any type of sequencer that kind of uses these, let's call them one and zero charts that this is going by in that array to navigate. All right, I'm dragging a little bit. Got to gotta hit some coffee, which while I am, um, hope you're subscribed to our channel. Uh, you know, we do put out at least one video a week. And any questions that come up, even if it doesn't have to do with exactly what I'm talking about right now, feel free to put them down in the chat and we can take some time and answer them. All right, but okay, so that kind of tells you how the inputs work. And then we have the outputs. So if we go back to our main program, then yeah, we had this destination, which is this out here. Let's just cross-reference it because really that's what I would have to do. All right, we're going to see, well, I was going to say we'd see them used in the outputs. Hmm, but they're not. They're used in drive, they're used in inputs, they're used in main routine. Oh, okay, and they're used in outputs. So not real clear, but okay, I would guess if I was looking for an output that it would be in the outputs. And mainly, this is the first thing that kind of looks <laughs> in some way like a like code I would want to troubleshoot is, all right, we have an unloader, and this is the unloader up. And it is going to go up if it's in auto mode, and looks like we had an auto unload, which I guess you can enable and disable it. And then we're looking for that unload output and tool index. I don't remember what tool index is. It'll hopefully come to me again. I definitely was not thinking that I would be looking at this program in 20 years, I guess, when I um, commented this. Now let's see if we can figure out what it actually took to get out of step one. So we go back to our main routine and let's see, we're looking for, yeah, what are we looking for? This array, monitor, oh, that's how I end up getting there, that's right there, okay. Okay, step one is looking, and here's where this is going to get brutal until we get this kind of worked out. It's looking for bit number two and bit number five. So if we go back, bit number two, where the clamps up. And now we got to go figure out what step three is. So we go back to, actually, I think I probably still have it here. Yep. Array, step three, we're still looking for those clamps. Now we're still looking for the wheels. So, and here's where this can get really confusing because you've got to compare it to the previous one to figure out what action are you really looking for. But I'm looking for eight, nine, 10. So whatever 10 is this time. So if we get our inputs, we go down to figure out what 10 is, encoder zero. But all right, mainly, now we need to back up and figure out what these outputs were in these sequencers. So we get our controller tags. All right, okay, and output zero actually has some, now that's really weird. It had, um, 
Huh, kind of curious now. And it had output zero and output three were on in step zero. So let's see what output zero and three even were. Huh? Drive down, clamps up, then, and then immediately afterward. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think I really, yeah, I was blowing past this anyway, so it probably ignored that one completely. I have to go back and look real close what's going on there. But mainly step one, we're looking for bit two and bit four. So if we go over to our outputs, actually, no, we can't even do that. This is this in the ear. This is where this one gets difficult. Is no, I'm looking for output two. I got to figure out where it's used. So we're going to go to our outputs up here. And we'll sort by the reference. And we find number two. All right, two was clamps up, and we took care of that one. Four is angle and drive. So that was, okay. And actually the way this one's set up, it doesn't actually, it's really, it's using, looking for the beginning of the angle. Now we have that as step two. So that's, that's not a problem there. And here's where this gets really gray, the sequencer out, because, okay, I assigned a bit arbitrarily for really the step that is looking for angle and drive. But, okay, now we go to step two. Oh, my head's even spinning trying to track this sequencer, and I wrote it. So step two. It's just looking for the clamps down. So in step two, we also need to look for clamps down. And then we had number 13. That so we'll have to hit the clamps, but also what the world is number 13. And 13 is wheels down. Okay. But I mean, this 13 lines up with nothing. And that's... That's why I kind of argue very against this now because, yeah, it allows you infinite programming flexibility but infinite headaches on the troubleshooting side. But I can't think of a reason that anybody should use what I did here besides the fact that, yeah, it, it looks really cool. And really, if you're going through, even today, if we're going through, we have a sequencer tab. And there is the sequencer input, the sequencer output, and the sequencer load. And they just look like what you should use to sequence instructions. But I don't think that that's a good use for them. I hope this gives you enough insight into navigating the SQI sequencer input instruction and SQO sequencer output instruction. But I would stress, even though this machine is running 20 years after I programmed it, it's still an example of how not to program a PLC to sequence through a step-by-step -step process. I'll put a link to the whole live stream in the description, and next you're going to see a few recommended links, including the PLC program methods for a machine sequencing series. Till next time. Hey, this is Till. And this is Amber of TW Controls. We run the automation store. Hey, thanks for finding our channel. Here's a playlist with some similar videos. And YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Please like our video and subscribe to our channel. And if our videos have helped you make some money and you're not using our products, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Till next time. See ya.